It is July 2008 and a controversial local landmark is being removed. It has been here for nearly a decade and it strangely is the grim reminder of an environmental disaster. Officials, locals and the wider public have argued whether it should stay or go. But the decision and money has been committed and the multi-million dollar project has started. The landmark in question is not a statue or a piece of artwork, but instead a wrecked remains of a transport ship. The removal and wreckage represents a legal argument that was used to make the ship's owners responsible for its running aground. I'm John and this is a brief history of. Today we're looking at the Oregon New Carissa disaster. A little background for a big ship. Our story starts at the end of the 1980s, some 19 years before the wreckage removal, with the laying down of a new dry goods transport ship. The ship was built by Imabari Shipbuilding Company in Japan, using an all steel construction, beginning on the 30th of August 1989. She was named the new Carissa, and was 195 metres long and 32 metres wide, with a draft of 10.8 metres when fully loaded. The vessel had a complement of 26 sailors who were in charge of the ship's gross weight tonnage of 36,571, pushed along by an 8,200 horsepower direct drive diesel engine. The ownership structure of the new Carissa, like many naval operations, is rather complex. She is registered to Panama, but her owners, much like her builders, are very much Japanese. She is under the operation of and owned by operator and managed Tei Heiyu Kain Co. Limited and TMM Co. Limited, respectively. Although ownership is via a Panama based subsidiary, Green Lane Shipping. This registration is a flag of convenience, allowing the owners to hire sailors under the working rules and conditions of the ship's registration country. But to add another level of complexity, the ship's home port was in the Philippines and her crew consisted of a Philippine captain and other personnel. I told you it's a confusing web, or maybe it's just me. The new Carissa would be pressed into service carrying wood chips used in the manufacture of paper between Japan and the US. Part of this would require entering US waters, and a law brought in in 1990 meant that any operator must be held financially responsible for any environmental impact in the case of an accident. Like with any potentially financially damaging risk, operators insure against this, and the new Carissa was no different. Approximately 23 million US dollars of environmental liability insurance was provided by Shipowners Insurance and Guarantee Company Limited of Hamilton, Bermuda. It is the beginning of February 1999 and the new Carissa is doing what she does best, heading towards the USA to collect wood chips. She is running with an empty hold and is bound for the port of Coos Bay, Oregon. She at this time has around 400,000 gallons of diesel and lube oil aboard. All aboard the ship are Philippine nationals. On the 3rd of February, and not far from their destination, a local pilot is assigned to guide the vessel into port. As the evening drew in, an ocean storm with winds that reached 39 knots was hitting central Oregon. The pilot, due to the weather conditions, was unable to reach the vessel. He informed the captain that he would not be able to assist until the morning and as such, entry to the port should not be attempted. Heeding the pilot's warnings, the captain ordered the turn away from the bay to open the empty holds and drop anchor. By now, the new Carissa was around 1.5 to 1.7 nautical miles from the bay. Only one anchor was dropped, but little did the crew realise that the chain was too short for the 20 to 25 knot winds. The evening gave way to the early hours of the morning of the 4th and the storm continued to rage. Slowly, the ship began to drag her chain. Poor watchkeeping of the crew meant that the movement went undetected for quite some time. 
she was dragged closer to the shore. Eventually the movement was noticed and the crew set to raise anchor to try and manoeuvre away from running aground. In the heavy storm and strong winds, nothing could stop the Carissa from moving closer and closer to the Oregon shore. Around three miles north of Coos Bay, the new Carissa ran aground on a sandbank. The collision was reported to officials at 9 o'clock in the morning and immediately a recovery operation was set into motion. The new Carissa represented an environmental issue with hundreds of gallons of fuel aboard. The immediate recovery attempts tried to make use of the new Carissa's own power, but the stricken vessel couldn't free itself. A unified command consisting of representatives from the Coast Guard, the State of Oregon and other rescue party operations were set up as soon as officials were first notified. Three objectives were set out for the unified command. To save personnel, save the ship and prevent spillage. The poor weather affected any immediate rescue when the only tugboat available in Coos Bay couldn't be used due to safety concerns. As long as the ship was still intact, refloating was the preferred option. The high winds prevented the crew from being rescued immediately, but eventually the Coast Guard helicopters were able to evacuate the sailors aboard and replace them with salvage specialists. During this time, a survey of the ship was undertaken by air, and so far it looked like it could be refloated, but there was a problem. No suitable ship was in the area that was powerful enough to drag the new Carissa off the sandbank. The nearest suitable vessel was based in Astoria, Oregon, roughly 170 miles away from Coos Bay. She was called the Salvage Chief, but she had not sailed for over a year and required provisions, fuel and the sourcing of a suitable crew. The turnaround time to ready the chief was going to be 18 hours, a long time to wait, especially in addition to the 24 hour journey time that she would take. All during this, the new Carissa sat precariously putting more strain on her hull. The salvage chief would not arrive at Coos Bay until the 8th of February, four days after the new Carissa ran aground. The waves and high winds continued to batter the stricken vessel, pushing her further along the beach. Although rescue had arrived, the additional 600 feet the new Carissa had been pushed shoreward put her out of the salvage chief's reach. Not long after, tar balls started to appear on the beach, hinting that the Carissa was leaking oil, meaning she had developed a crack somewhere on her hull. Because of this, the three main objectives for salvage were changed to ensure safety of personnel and the local community, minimise damage to the environment and finally salvage the vessel. The now leaking ship posed a serious risk to the local ecosystem. Cleanup activity preparation began almost as soon as the ship got beached, but the leaking fuel had already covered wildlife and had leaked into the vulnerable local environment. With another storm on the horizon and a high probability of salvage causing the ship to break up, rescue workers were confronted with a horrible last resort decision, whether to burn the ship or not. You see, setting a light to the vessel may sound like a bad idea, but this could mean the toxic fuel would not contaminate the environment directly. Obviously, there was still the environmental cost, but by now it was a case of least worst outcome. This rock and hard place decision was made for the salvage team when it was decided that the ship was a complete structural write-off and thus movement was out of the question, meaning an in-situ burn was to be the outcome. The Unified Command attempted the first burn on the 10th of February using a combination of napalm and incendiary devices, but to the disappointment to all involved, only one of the ship's tanks set alight. Time to bring out the big guns. A Navy Explosives Ordnance Disposal Unit from Whitby Island, Washington was employed to have a second crack at burning the fuel. The unit used 400 pounds of explosives to rupture the fuel tanks and to sustain the burn, a locally brewed napalm mixture was employed. The fire would last 33 hours and result 
in between 165 and 255,000 US gallons burnt. How the things would get worse for the vessel. All during the explosions and grounding, the main structure was weakening and its integrity couldn't last any longer. At around midnight on the 11th of February, the vessel broke into two sections and a now separated ship started to drive in different directions. On the 26th of February, the salvage teams managed to float the 440 foot bow section and prepare it for towing. By the 1st of March, the tugboat Sea Victory had successfully towed the bow from the beach and out to sea, but a return of stormy weather resulted in the cable snapping. The bow, now loose, free floated for 14 hours until it ran aground near Waldport, Oregon on the 3rd of March, roughly 80 miles to the north of the original grounding site. It was refloated again on the 8th of March and towed out to 280 miles off the coast where it was sunk with explosives and cannon fire from two US Navy ships, the destroyer USS David R. Ray and the submarine USS Bremerton. Interestingly, the cannons and explosives didn't fully sink the bow, requiring an additional torpedo before it was sent to the seabed. The stern, however, would remain on the beach for nearly a decade, but we'll come to that in a bit. Like with most disasters, the authorities set out to find the root cause of the disaster. And like most disasters, everyone blamed everyone else. With the government blaming the crew and the insurance company, Britannia Steamship Insurance Association, blaming the less than useful Coast Guard charts and the pilot not telling the ship to drop anchor where it did. This resulted in two lawsuits, one from the insurers claiming around $96 million and a counter from the US government claiming around $7 million. Both parties would reach a settlement of a net amount to the government for $6.5 million in 2004. But this wasn't the end of the legal proceedings. In an interesting tactic, Oregon State demanded a $25 million bond to cover the dismantling and cleanup costs, as well as charging the ship's owners a rent of $1,500 per day for storage costs. Needless to say, the ship's owners and insurers refuted these claims, and the case went to trial. Let's take a moment to appreciate the case here. The state of Oregon was asserting that the crashed ship was actually trespassing on state property. Bold claim. But it did actually pay off when on the 13th of November 2002, a jury sided with the state's argument, and the $25 million was put into an escrow account as appeals and the like were hashed out. The shipping company would get back around $5 million after an appeal in 2006. Now, before we come back to the implications of this legal case and the stern, we have to look at the criminal side of the investigation and what happened to the crew. Captain Morgado and his Filipino crew had some questions to answer after the grounding, and this required them to stay in the US for several weeks as the Coast Guard questioned them. The captain pled the Fifth Amendment for most of his questions, which is a smart move, and after their testimonies, they were finally allowed to return home. The investigation did find the captain and his first and third officers responsible for the crash, but not enough to prove criminal wrongdoing, and they would not see any charges brought against them. Bearing in mind, the stern was still beached, representing a constant reminder of the disaster, the result was pretty unpalatable. Okay, now we can get back to the landmark previously known as the stern of the new Carissa. The state of Oregon had kind of painted itself into a corner with its trespassing trial, as their whole argument would have been pretty much seen as a cash grab unless the stern was actually removed. And this leads us back to 2008 and the somewhat controversial dismantling and removal of the last few remaining sections of the new Carissa. The removal of the stern proved to be more difficult than originally anticipated, as years of waves and storms had wedged the wreckage into the sand, up to 20 to 30 feet in some places. 
It was decided that the remains be dismantled by the use of jack-up barges, which allowed crews to work on the ship, cutting her up piece by piece. By September 2008, most of the visual wreckage was removed, leaving only a few small pieces. By November, the recovery crews and barges were gone, and thus the new Carissa was no more. But although no humans were killed, the death toll from the fuel that did manage to escape into the ecosystem was thought to be responsible for over 3,000 shore and seabirds. Rather worryingly, if it wasn't for the burning of the ship, this toll would have been significantly higher. 